Hello, uh, welcome to CS4U. Uh, I'm Cheng Nian. I'm an assistant professor at the Charter School of Computer Science, certainly from University of Waterloo. Uh, my major research area includes software engineering and uh, program languages. I'm particularly interested in designing techniques and tools to improve software reliability and the developer's productivity. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about how to engineer reliable software. Especially, I'm going to cover the basic concepts and the importance of the rel uh, software reliability, as well as techniques to improve uh, or ensure software reliability. So first, uh, just to make sure every, everyone is on the same page, I'm going to start from the very beginning, a computer. So a computer includes hardware. Hardware is the physical parts in your computer. So it, it could be CPU, the central processing unit, which does the computation in your computer. It's, a, it's similar to our brain. And then the memory is uh, used to store volatile data. That means if the data, if, if you uh, restart your computer, the memory will be empty and then all the data in the memory will be lost. So memory is, uh, is similar to our short-term memory, okay? just for uh, temporary or immediate computation. Data storage, such as hard disk drive or solid state drive is used to store data permanently. So even though you restart the server or there is a IT, uh, the, there is an out, uh, no, power outage, the, the data is still there, okay. The other uh, hardware, uh, includes like monitor, mouse, or keyboards, uh, which is just for humans to interact with the computer. But I'm not an expert on hardware, and uh, I'm going to talk about software. So software informally can be defined as a collection of instructions to tell uh, a computer what to do and how to do. So the instructions is for the CPUs. The CPU interprets and executes uh, each instruction and uh, coordinates or interacts with other hardware components. The software can be classified into two groups or two types. The first one is the operating system. It's a, it's a layer on top of hardware here. Uh, operating system encapsulates all the details of hardware and it provides a unified uh, interface for application software. Okay. So the most uh, prevalent operating systems are Windows or Mac OS. If you use uh, a smart device, probably you're using like iOS or Android. Uh, there are other operating systems which are less common uh, for uh, uh, customers, uh, but uh, not very common for software developers. For example, Linux is the most widely, is the most widely used operating system to host the web servers. And I, I'm also using Linux to, for my daily research and uh, development. Uh, but uh, certainly I made the slides on Windows because I, I'm more familiar, familiar with PowerPoint, which is application software. Okay. So the application software directly deals, uh, deals with end users. Uh, the user usually uses application software for, for his or her daily work or daily entertainment. For example, video games uh, are one type of application software. Browsers are also application software. Uh, even websites are application software. And then there's a difference between browsers and the websites. So websites, are running remotely on a server, which you don't have physical access, but you can interact with the remote website through a browser. So there is a network connection between the browser and the website. And so that you could interact or use the website. So now let's see software bug. So a bug is basically an error uh, in software. Uh, there are, could be other names like flaw, fault, or defect, 
as long as the term refers to something wrong in your software. And the bug causes software to produce incorrect or unexpected results. So I have an example here. This is the calculator on Windows 7, okay, the screenshot here. And then there was a bug in the calculator. So if you want to compute the square root of four minus two, uh, no matter which uh, calculator mode you use, either standard mode or the scientific mode, you get a result which is not zero. It's a tiny negative floating point number. Okay, it's not zero, which is the correct result. Um, later, Microsoft fixed this bug, uh, I think uh, in Windows 10. So now I can I, I cannot reproduce this bug on my Windows machine. Another symptom of software bug is the software does not behave as expected. So for example, this screenshot, I, I wanted to access my Google account and I wanted to do some adjustment uh, in the settings. But sadly, the Chrome browser rendered this web page, which has a magical number 500. So 500 is the number to indicate that there is an error or a bug in the remote server and the server could not service your request. Here is another here is another bug from Windows. So this is the classical uh, blue screen from Windows. This indicates that there was a bug uh, manifested uh, inside the Windows and the Windows could not recover from the bug and therefore Windows needed to restart. Okay, I would say that uh, this uh, blue screen is much more beautiful than the blue screen used in Windows XP or Windows 7. I think this is much more cute. So bugs, why do we need to care about bugs? Simply because bugs are prevalent and costly, okay? In terms of prevalency, uh, according to a study, within a one year between October 28 and September 2019, uh, on github.com, there were 10, over 20 million bugs fixed that year. So just in case you don't know, github.com is a, uh, is a collaboration platform for software development. So people could share or uh, open source their uh, software projects and other people could contribute to the software projects. A lot of IT companies are also using github.com to manage uh, their internal software development, for example, eBay. Um, they use github.com to host their source code base so that their developers could contribute or collaborate uh, on github.com. But certainly you cannot see uh, their repositories, their code from github.com because it's private. Second, uh, bugs are also cost costly. So according to a study conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology 20 years ago in 2002, uh, throughout the 2000s, there were around 60 billion US dollars annually cost to the US industry. So this data was very, very old, but uh, I'm pretty sure that nowadays the number is, will be much larger, mainly because uh, nowadays uh, the, tech, uh, the, the computer infrastructure is everywhere. People have, uh, can access uh, computers or uh, mobile computing devices uh, much easier than 20 years ago. Uh, next, in the following slides, I'm going to show you uh, three recent bugs. Uh, the reason I, 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 I decided to show these bugs is because <clears throat> though you don't necessarily know these bugs, but they could affect your daily lives. Okay. The first one is OpenSSL. It's a widely used security protocol library. So a library is similar to, to, to software. It's a collection of instructions. The only difference is 
a library could be used by uh, to to build other software. Okay, that's why OpenSSL um, OpenSSL is widely used by yeah, like for example Yahoo, Stack Overflow, DuckDuckGo. Okay, so in 2014, people found there was a bug, which is uh, which was a memory bug. And this bug could be uh, exploited by hackers. So, so that the hackers could uh, illegally log the, into the websites and uh, steal uh, sensitive information, such as credit card information or personal information. So you might think I don't use these uh, websites, but you probably are using or uh, will use the Canada Revenue Agency website. So even though you are now using, you will eventually use it okay, every year. So the website was hacked due to this bug and the CRA decided to shut the entire website down until uh, the library, the, the cracked, the fixed version uh, uh, was updated. And as a consequence, they also postponed the deadline for filing individual tax returns that year. Okay, the second bug is uh, Amazon Prime Day down in 2018. So Prime Day is uh, basically a day for Prime, Amazon Prime members to, to, to shop there to, for shopping. And there are a lot of deals that day. And uh, apparently people were very interested in purchasing these deals. And uh, within a very short period of time, a lot of people logged uh, onto amazon.com and uh, which caused a lot of traffic to the website server. And the, web ser the, the server could not handle that many traffic, that much traffic. So the server went down, okay? So this is a non-functional requirement. That is, uh, the website is not scalable enough. The last bug I want to show is British Airway. Uh, there is a there was an IT outage in 2018. Actually, uh, from 2017, there was a series of IT outages more than six times. Okay, but that year that IT outage caused the 100 flights to be canceled, and over 200 other flights to be delayed. So all these three bugs, you probably don't know the the cause or the existence of the bugs but they could direct, indirectly affect our daily lives. So how software fails? There could be multiple symptoms. The first one is a crash. So for example, if you are using a mobile app, but suddenly the mobile app disappears and uh, the cell phone returns to the home screen, that is a crash. So the crash, you probably you don't, you just, see a sudden exit of the app. This, this is definitely not ideal, especially you're playing video game and your progress is lost after the crash. The second symptom is a hand. Uh, uh, this is, for example, you're, if you're using a website and you click a button and then the entire screen becomes gray and you cannot click any button, but uh, the entire web page freezes there and uh, does not progress. And you don't know what is going on. You don't know, even know what, whether the, the remote server is working or not. So in this case, you, you need to like uh, falsely close the, the, the browser or the application on your desktop. Data corruption is more severe because it could uh, jeopardize your data. For example, I'm uploading a photo to a remote server and uh, after the uploading is done, I delete my, the, the photo in my local copy, the, my local copy of the photo. Then there will be only one copy of the photo on the remote server. But there is a bug uh, in, in the transmission uh, library and uh, the bug causes the photo to be crafted. And uh, later when you want to access the photo, you cannot uh, correctly uh, show the photo because the photo file is corrupted. This happened to me because when I was an undergraduate student, I was working on my uh, uh, course report 
on Microsoft Word, and uh, the Word crashed, and uh, all the uh, document file, the entire document file, is corrupted. Uh, incorrect functionality here uh, deals with uh, the implementation of your software, and uh, your software does not uh, behave as expected. And but this is a minor issue because uh, uh, not minor issue, but uh, the, compared to data corruption, this is uh, uh, slightly better. Performance degradation uh, degradation uh, concerns about uh, usually happens in long running software. For example, a website which runs uh, uh, twenty four seven. Uh, if there is a bug, uh, say that uh, the website always asks for memory from the operating system, but never returns it. Eventually, the web server will exhaust the entire memory and uh, your server will become uh, non-responsive. Security vulnerability. The open SSL bug is definitely one uh, good example of security vulnerability, which enables hackers to exploit the bug to, to do something evil. Okay, software reliability. We finally come here. Uh, but uh, before defining the uh, software reliability, we need to define the failure. So failure is basically the symptom when a bug manifests itself. So I show you three figures here. Uh, each figure indicates one type of failure. Uh, for example, the first one is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a, a cryptocurrency. Uh, it's an electronic coin. That is, uh, you don't have a note of, of the Bitcoin, uh, but you have a secret number, uh, which is the Bitcoin. And uh, apparently hackers could exploit some bugs on the trading platform to steal your Bitcoins. And nowadays one Bitcoin, I think is, uh, is around 60,000 US dollars. It's, it was very expensive. Uh, but when I first, uh, uh, got to know Bitcoin, I think, uh, in uh, 20, uh, I forgot, 10, probably 10 years ago, it was only like 100 US dollars. Uh, a failure could also be a rocket uh, crash. Uh, I think a decade ago, there was a rocket uh, crashed due to software bug. And then this is the blue screen of the Windows XP, I believe. Uh, you see that uh, the blue screen is uh, less beautiful than the blue screen of the Windows 10. Okay, reliability. So reliability can be approximately defined as one minus number of failures within a period of time. Okay, this is uh, very, very informal. So basically within a period of time, you count the number of failures if there is no failure, then the reliability is high. If uh, the, there are a lot of failures, the reliability is very low, okay? So the important goal of software development is to achieve very low failure rate, hence a very high reliability. So how to improve or ensure software reliability? This is an important research problem widely studied in multiple computer science fields. So I, I think nearly, all computer science fields could deal with uh, or could work on software reliability. It's just the, from different pers perspectives. For example, uh, the researchers in machine learning uh, community could work on uh, software reliability by improving uh, the, uh, the reliability of machine learning libraries or by improving the robustness of the machine learning models against adversary examples. The data, database community could work on techniques to improve the reliability or the resilience of the database management system. But I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about uh, three research fields that are relevant to my own. Okay, the first one is a program languages, which is a, com which is a, a computer science subfield, uh, which deals with uh, programming language design and the imp implementation. So one good example is the evolution history of programming languages. 
So initially, when the computer was uh, uh, designed, people had to use machine code to write programs. So machine code is basically a sequence of binary numbers, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. So uh, the sequence of number encodes the instructions to the CPU as long, uh, uh, along with the arguments. But you see that uh, the machine code is really difficult to pass uh, and, and understand. And uh, it's also uh, the developer at that, at that time uh, when writing a program needed not only uh, take care of the logic of the software, but also the low level details of the computer architecture. For example, they need to care about uh, where the data is in the memory, how to read from the memory, how to write to the memory, okay. something like that. So people were not happy about writing machine code, so they developed uh, assembly code. Assembly code is here. You see that uh, you it, it, it's better, at least it's text, not the numbers. And also uh, it's, it's much more clear because uh, here each, uh, the first word is the instruction to the CPU like push. Uh, the second, the third, the right hand side uh, the, is the arguments to that instruction. Uh, so the pr productivity is improved and uh, it's less error prone because uh, people, it becomes less likely for people to make mistakes. Uh, but still, uh, people still needed to take care of the low level computer architecture details. Uh, which uh, was not ideal and error prone. So they designed C language, which is like this. And uh, this code snippet, the C code snippet implements the square function of a number. Okay, Even though you don't know C, you can still tell that uh, what this function does is return a uh, number times number. Uh, C is very popular, uh, though it's old, I think it's over 20 years. <clears throat> and the people are still using it. Why did they use it? For example, the Linux kernel, a part of the Mac OS, and also the Windows. <clears throat> C allows people or developers to directly manipulate the memory, which uh, was a key feature for, for operating system developers. But on the other hand, uh, developers need to take care of the memory management themselves and it's error prone. For example, the OpenSSL is written in C and the memory bug uh, has caused the catastrophic uh, consequences. Therefore, the PL researcher program language researchers uh, designed Rust, which is a, a replacement for C. Uh, though I'm not sure whether it will eventually replace uh, C, but it's definitely a good complement to C. So Rust is, uh, is, as, uh, is as fast or as efficient as C, but provides guarantee about memory safety. Okay. So from this evolution history, you see that uh, the trend is to, to increase uh, the, mm, the, the efforts of computing power. Uh, for example, initially machine code uh, developers need to write the machine code and uh, need, need, needed to take, uh, take care of everything. But from C, we only, take, uh, we only need to focus on the logic of the software. And uh, for, uh, for Rust, uh, in addition to the benefits of C, Rust also guarantees uh, the memory safety by leveraging the computing power. Uh, the second field I'm going to talk about very briefly is formal methods. So this is a field to use mathematical uh, approaches to prove uh, software reliability. For example, I can uh, prove that a software is 100% uh, correct with respect to a certain property. For example, I can try to uh, I can try to prove that OpenSSL is correct uh, in terms of memory safety, though it's a difficult and challenging job. The downside of using or the cons of using formal methods is the learning 
curve of formal methods is very steep. It's not accessible to, to all the programmers. So you need to have a strong mathematical background. And also it's very time consuming and resource intensive to, you, to apply formal methods to prove the correctness of software. Uh, it's only worthwhile to use like uh, formal methods to prove the correctness of safety critical uh, software systems such as train control systems or plane airplane control systems. So, uh, and uh, one uh, side note is it's definitely not worthwhile to apply formal methods to apply uh, to to develop a like a mobile app, like a Flappy Bird. The last one is software engineering, which is my own research area. Uh, so if you choose to study computer science, you can, you can choose to study three concrete courses. One is a, a software requirement from which you will learn how to, uh, how to communicate with your customers, how to get uh, their requirements clearly without any ambiguity, and how to formulate a requirement document, uh, which specifies uh, the software to be developed uh, and the second course is software design, which is also itself uh, is a subfield of software engineering. And uh, from software design course, you will learn how to design software. For uh, nowadays, uh, software has become uh, has has become very large. Uh, you already a system of different pieces of uh, no, you already a system of multiple pieces of software. So you need to design the protocol between the different uh, software components, how they should interact with each other, how they should integrate with each other. And the testing. Uh, I personally teach a testing course. Uh, from the course, you will learn how to test your software, how to find the bugs, how to ensure the software reliability. Okay, testing. Uh, yeah, in the following, I'm going to briefly talk about uh, software testing. Uh, uh, but I would like to uh, rephrase a term that is a program. Program is a software, okay? It's a, a collection of instructions. But I would like to uh, uh, model a program as a function. So, and, and the formulation is correct, actually. So each program is a function. It has a domain, which is uh, the set of inputs for that program. And uh, the output of the program is the range, which is a set of elements too. Okay. Uh, for example, uh, for the browser, uh, for, take the browser for example. Uh, so the domain is a set of URLs. Okay. And uh, for each URL, the browser will render a web page of the corresponding website. And the render the HTML document is, is the uh, one element in the range, okay. So what, now what is testing? So testing is basically first pick a subset X uh, from the domain, okay. And then for each element in the selected set, we check whether the, uh, the program functions well or functions as expected with respect to the, the, the element X. So you see that we, in, instead of testing the entire domain, uh, we just uh, testing with a small number of elements uh, to see whether the program F functions as expected. Here is a contrived example. So suppose I have a customer who wants to de develop a program to add two numbers up. So this is very simple. And here is me. Uh, I said, oh, no problem. Here it is. Uh, so since you, have, you want to add two numbers up, I'm, I, I'm, I wrote a program F, which takes two arguments, X and Y. Okay, this is a mathematical language actually. Uh, and x, uh, f x y equals x times y. Okay. So certainly there is a bug, but I'm, I'm going to pretend that I don't know there is a bug. And uh, in order to increase the confidence, my confidence in the correctness of the software, I'm going to write a test 
to show you that uh, the program I write is 100% correct, though not true actually. So what I write is, oh, I'm going to test uh, the program with the input two, two, okay? So X is two, Y is two, then the result of the F22 should be four. If it's not four, then the test fails. But apparently F22 equals four because two times two equals four, two plus four, uh, no, two plus two also equals four. So the test passes, okay? So what's the problem here? The problem is the testing does not prove the correctness of the software. You see that? Even though I use the software testing, I, I still could not find the bug. That is the weakness of testing. And also that is how the software testing researchers focus on, try to overcome the limitation of the testing. Now what to do? So I can add a new test, which is a one and a three. So X equals one, Y equals three. And then I test whether the, uh, the output of the function, the program F13 uh, is four or not, okay? So because a one plus three is four, but uh, my real implementation is uh, multiplication. So one times three equals three, okay? So this test fails and, that's, and then I find, oh, my, my software has a bug. So I should fix it. Uh, okay, so people might ask, what if I test all the possible inputs, okay? So this is generally not possible because enumerating all the inputs will take forever, okay? It will never terminate. For example, you cannot enumerate all the integers, right? And especially uh, it's, uh, it's more challenging because nowadays the, soft, the input to software is very complex. It's high dimensional data. That is, uh, it's not only a number, it's, uh, it's a vector or matrix of numbers. So technically you cannot enumerate all the inputs. Second, even though you can enumerate all the possible inputs, because in order to write a test, you, you not only need to specify the test input to the program, you also need to specify the expected output of the test. Uh, for example, for the two fours here, okay. Uh, if you enumerate all the possible inputs, then you need to specify the test, uh, uh, the expected test output for each input, which is time consuming. You cannot afford that. Okay. So software testing research studies the following problems. It's not, the list is not complete definitely, uh, uh, but uh, I think these are the major uh, focuses of software, software testing research. The first one is how to design software test inputs or how to select test inputs effectively. So certainly in the uh, example previously, uh, the two and the two is not good enough. The second area is uh, how to evaluate the effectiveness of tests and how to use uh, the, the efficacy of tests to guide the selection of test inputs. The third one is the efficiency of tests. So uh, you need to run the tests uh, periodically. For example, if I make some change to my source code, I need to rerun the tests to ensure that uh, my change is uh, correct, does not break anything. So for example, at Google, developers are required to write tests for their changes to the source code. And uh, when they want to submit their changes to the source code, the source code repository, they need to run the tests so if the tests, the uh, if running tests takes a lot of time, then it will slow down the development process. So people are not have will not be happy about that, and that's why we need to study how to speed up the execution of tests. The last one is automation of tests. So for example, I'm developing a mobile app, and I want to test whether my app can crash or not. No whether my app crashes or not, or has bugs or not. So what I can do is I, as a person, I manually uh, like click, swipe, uh, long press the screen to interact with the app. 
but that is in expensive and slow and tedious for me uh, because it takes a lot of time. And especially for evolving app, uh, that is the code base of the app uh, keeps changing. So for each change, I also need to validate whether uh, uh, the change introduces new bugs or not. So one solution to automated uh, testing is uh, just develop some uh, program to automatically interact with the app. Right? And, and here I show you one example. So this is the current, my current research, one of my current research, which aims to uh, automatically, automatically test Android apps. So what it does is, okay, so this is the emulator. The right-hand side is the emulator of Android. The right-hand side is a terminal. It's, a, it's my own testing tool, okay? So what it does is, as I pick one Android app and the testing tool will automatically, automatically interact with the app by uh, calling the, the, the services uh, or some functionalities of the Android operating system. So you see that uh, it seems that uh, someone is, uh, is using the app. Actually, no, only my tool is using the app. So the goal of doing this is uh, with this uh, random exploration of the app, so some bug might be triggered and, uh, and we will find the bug, we will record the bug, and then people can fix that bug. You see that by leveraging the computing power, uh, which is uh, widely available on, on our desktop, uh, we could uh, save uh, a lot of human efforts. So today I have covered uh, the software bug, what is a software bug, and I show you a lot of examples of software bugs, and I also demonstrate how important it, uh, how important it is to, to remove or to detect or remove software bugs. I also show you how testing works. Uh, basically it's a random, or not random, it's a sampling of the input space of the program and uh, validate whether your program uh, behaves as expected with the selected inputs. And uh, lastly, I show you uh, what is uh, software testing research about. And uh, I also show the, a demo of my current research, which is to automatically test Android apps. Okay, that, uh, this concludes my talk. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I will see you later on the Q&A session.